Jesus name. The name of this message today is the purpose and partnership. The power of purpose and partnership part two. I spoke about this a while back and we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Do you remember that chapter that Paul wrote that had all of those things about we and our and us and all of the togetherness as God was moving us together on his mission that way? That was what that first one was. But now in this second one, we're going to look at some Old Testament scriptures and some Old Testament things that are happening. But it ain't old. It's right here and it's right now and it's for you today in Jesus' name. What if today we were to make this this uh, this connection, this commitment. What, what if with this commitment, Randall, I'm going to read this off to you. What if we today were determined with all of our mind, with our heart, and way down in our spirit? You see, things begin to come into our mind, and then they transfer into our heart, and we determine whether we're going to bite off on it or not and allow it to get down into our spirit and to begin to live from our spirit man in Jesus' name. If you've been around here long enough, you begin to understand that. You begin to understand the difference between living a soulish life and living a life from my spirit connected with the Holy Ghost. So what I'm going to ask you to do today is this. What if we were to make a determination, not just in our mind or in our heart, but way down in our our spirit? And this would be the determination to live on purpose, on Jesus' mission, in partnership until Jesus comes again. Now, that's not a lightweight commitment. Do you want to, were you willing to live on purpose, on Jesus' mission, in partnership with each other? I'm not just talking about treasure, but I'm talking about kingdom. You know, around here, we're about the kingdom. We're not about one church. We're about the church, the bride of Christ in Jesus' name. Until Jesus comes. In order for you to make that kind of commitment, guess what? You got to take away the commitment that you made to yourself to live for yourself to live for your way or even your ministry. Lord, I'm in partnership with you. I'm in partnership with this body of Christ. I'm on Jesus' mission, no no matter what, until you come again. I'm gonna pray that prayer. If you come in agreement with me right now. Lord God, we've been on a lot of missions in in our lives. My nine-year-old grandson just asked me, what's a missionary? I said, you wanna be a missionary, Harrison? He says, what's a missionary? I believe he's learning that right now this morning. Missionaries go on missions, Harrison. You've been on a lot of missions on your little video games, haven't you? Yes, Papa, I have. How about if you went on a real mission for Jesus and just did what he wanted the rest of our life, the rest of your life? Do you want to be a missionary? He said, I don't know. I said, would you pray about Harrison? He's in the same place we are. Lord God, right now, in Jesus' name, we see that we've been on our own mission to fulfill our own wants, our selfish needs, But Lord God, I've also seen a great dismissal of our own self-interested mission. Instead, we're shifting over and saying, okay, God, I'm on your mission. I'm living beyond what I see. I'm trusting beyond what I feel. That's a huge thing right now. Huge thing for this church. A huge thing for all of mankind to, to live beyond what we feel and not just be so dominated by our feelings but to tell our feelings who we are in Christ Jesus. So Lord God, now we say, I'm not living on my own personal mission. I'm gonna live on your mission in Jesus' name. And Lord, I know I need partners. Some of us have been so independent, fiercely independent, usually because we've been hurt before and then had trouble trusting people. So that's okay. But now we're coming back and we're saying, you know what? It's not gonna be perfect, but I'm gonna trust again because I need partners in my life in Jesus' name to hold up my arms when I'm tired and to cry with me sometimes, but not to leave me crying, but to bring me into the presence of God for his healing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We see in Paul's day, he said, we're going to run, we're going to battle, we're going to run this race, we're going to fight. In Paul's day, in the Acts church time, I'm going to talk about three time periods here just real briefly uh, in scripture. The Acts church, when they were on Jesus' mission, what were they doing? Well, they were building the church. They were building the bride of Christ, right? But how about in the Old Testament days before there was a church? Well, they were building the kingdom of God, weren't they? That's what we see with Nehemiah who's what we're going to talk about today. By the way, the the name Nehemiah, check this out. The name Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. So here's Nehemiah, this prophet, named the Lord comforts. And then all of his life, what did he do? He brought comfort. 
He brought comfort. He saw the needs of people and God let him meet those needs in the flesh and in the spirit in Jesus' name. Say, the Lord comforts me. The Lord comforts me. Do we need some comfort right now? Well, God has sent the prophet Nehemiah to speak to us today in Jesus' name because he's going to comfort me today too. Is that all right with y'all? In 586, under King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed the wall that went around Jerusalem. It had been destroyed before. It got destroyed later also. But in 586, this is what we're going to talk about. Fifty years later, Nebuchadnezzar and all of his Jewish people had been in exile, and they started to come back a little at a time. But Nebuchadnezzar got this vision that we have to rebuild this wall. Now, I want to tell you something right now. The American church is in the same place that Jerusalem was right then. I'm talking to you right now, right this second. The American church doesn't really know that their wall's been torn down. They're just trying to put some brick and mortar back together and trying to make sure that the ties get, get put back together. But that's not real, y'all. There has to be a realization that we're in exile as Christians right now. How are we in exile? Well, we're not even meeting together. Where is everybody this morning? The same, every church in town has got the same situation. Because of fear. Because of the lies of the enemy. Because of apathy. You see, the whole reason for the pandemic is to destroy the church. Yes. To stop us from meeting together because you know what? When we come together where there's power. If we're separated, what happens in our natural man? We lose heart, don't we? We need each other. We need each other. We need to walk together. We need to see that, you know what? You're struggling too. Let's struggle together in Jesus' name. So right now, as we talk about this today, let's don't talk about it as if this is some uh, situation that, that happened uh, 2,500 years ago. Let's, let's look at it right now in Jesus' name. And what are we going to do to rebuild this wall? Check this out. So the Nehemiah had this, this vision that they wanted to rebuild the temple and all of the, all the people that live there in Jerusalem were taken captive. And so now they're in Babylon, they're in captivity, and they're slowly trying to come back. But he wants to rebuild the temple. But what did he have to do first, Randall? To rebuild that temple, he had to rebuild the wall first. Now, it only took him 52 days to rebuild that wall. I'm going to talk to you about that later. But it took 20 years to rebuild the temple. Now, I want to talk to you about 20 years right now. What happened 20 years ago in America? 9-11 happened 20 years ago. Now, it would have seemed like if we were following what the Lord wanted us to do, that we would have built a wall of protection insulating America, insulating the truth of Almighty God, insulating the population of, 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 of truth of our churches and let the churches build up and, and be empowered in Jesus' name. But instead, over the course of these 20 years, do you think the church is stronger or less strong than the turn of the century? So we've let the enemy in closer and closer, haven't we? Because his job is to devour and to steal and to take these things away. Are we going to continue to do that? Here's one reason that this has happened, because we're throwing rocks at each other. God's going to show us in Nehemiah how to stop doing that today in Jesus' name. And we're going to stop doing it today in Jesus' name. All right. Let's see. Have you got uh, some pictures for me there, Lane? Show me that first picture of that little rascal. Last week we talked about the power of life. Uh-oh. There's old Sonny James. He's got his coonskin cap on. He's going to be a hooper. That's a picture of hope right now. Lane, show me Miss Judy's picture. Uh, 
This is a picture of hope completed. This is a picture of what Paul talks about right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? We want you, treasure, to run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. Strict training. Would you like some strict training around here? No, most of you are running off instead of getting the strict training in Jesus' name. But I'm so glad you're here, okay? We're going to get a little strict today, all right? I talk about it in Journey. I say, I'm not here to do spiritual training. I'm here to train your spirit. God said, take their spirit, see their spirit, and let me train their spirit and change their spirit, man, in Jesus' name. Do you not know that all the runners run the race, but only one gets a prize run in such a way to get a prize? Everyone who competes in the game also goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. Uh-oh, we still got Miss Judy's picture up there, don't we? But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. There she is. There's a crown princess right there in Jesus' name. I did not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer merely beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my own body and I'll make it a slave so that after all I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I love Paul's courage right here. He's not talking about somebody else, he's talking about himself. He's saying, I, this is my desire to run this race. And it's not going to be aimless. Some of us have lived a life aimlessly, haven't we? We've thought our purpose was one thing. We've changed to another purpose, to another purpose. Right now, God is narrowing the purpose right now. Aim small, miss small, ladies and gentlemen, in Jesus' name. Shoot at that target. Shoot at that prize. To receive that crown of glory, that crown of righteousness, that crown of faithfulness, so that in God's time, we would bring that crown right back to his feet, wouldn't we? In Jesus' name. Because there's nothing selfish in us anymore. There's nothing selfish in Paul when he writes this. I had a friend of mine named Chase Bowers. He's a great pastor and a friend. And, and, he, and he said, I went out and ran eight miles the other day. He said, first of all, I learned some things. Number one, I'm not that fast. <laughs> then he said, I learned I could go farther than I thought I could. Jim, if I just put one foot in front of another. I learned that when the suffering begins, the race starts. Is that right, Jim? Got a real runner right here amongst us. Then I learned that God has more breath for me than I thought I had. There's somewhere down deep in your spirit that you can breathe where you think you can't breathe. That he is putting you in a scuba diving outfit. If he wants to send you to the bottom of the sea, he'll breathe for you in Jesus' name. And it's time for us to quit being lightweight about our own breath and our own needs and our own thoughts all the time at the forefront and be on Jesus' mission to love others like he loved us relentlessly in Jesus' name. I see a transference of the power right now in Jesus' name. And it's time to encounter a supernatural God. Last week we talked about Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3 is talking about time, isn't it? We talked about the message was the power of life. Well, you know what? In a little while, you've got a lifetime. What's it look like? You're starting to see the big picture right now, aren't you? In Jesus' name. Open it up for him, Lord God. Open it up all the way in Jesus' name. May today be a rallying cry for the American church to rise. The denominational separation would end. And from the rubble of fear and confusion and doctrinal detail, we will rise for Jesus. In Acts 15, there's this thing called the Jerusalem Council. The gospel was being formulated and the gospel was already, 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 had already happened when Jesus went to the cross and came out of the tomb. But Paul was learning how to preach it and teaching them how to preach it and teaching everything. And there was confusion. And they got together in this Jerusalem Council and they said, okay, y'all. Forget all of the, 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 the little bitty details that you're chasing your tail around here. We're going to think about one thing. We're going to talk about the gospel of Christ Jesus, the cross, Jesus crucified, Jesus resurrected. And then we're not going to do these sexually immoral things and sacrifice blood sacrifices. Besides that, that's who we are in Jesus' name. If the American church will get back to this place right here, we'll come together in Jesus' name. 
And that's our prayer right now. Will you do your part to not chunk rocks at our other friends and to build them up in Jesus' name and to love them and expect absolutely nothing in return? May we see today be the power of purpose and partnership right now. The power of purpose and partnership. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to begin speaking out of chapter 2. The other day, Kimberly gave us these little wagon wheels like this. So today the message is about the power of purpose and partnership. Well, she gave us this wagon wheels and I said, yeah, that's a cool wagon wheel. I, I know, man, I see Festus. Festus riding his mule Ruth right along with the wagon train right there, okay? Now she said, she goes like this. She said, no, what are the spokes for, Robert Doherty? All oh, the spokes, and I, I scratched my head, you know how I am, kind of an airhead. She said, the spokes are us. You see, every one of those spokes supports that axle, supports that wheel, and keeps that thing turning, in Jesus' name. What if one of those spokes isn't there? What if those, one of those spokes is gone, Rudy? Things liable to break down, isn't it? Okay, not going to run smooth in Jesus' name. See, there's a partnership. There's a part that you are playing as part of this family. And let's look at how Nehemiah described it right now. Nehemiah chapter 1 is about the political groundwork. Nehemiah chapter 1 is when Austin, some of us, the, the, the Jewish people were doing nothing. They were in slavery and they were all just sitting around complaining. Does that sound familiar? But Nehemiah said, no, we're going to do something. And he began to hear from the Lord God. And he came directly in contention with all the political atmosphere and all the things that he had to do. And he got real sneaky and he went to figure out what do we got to do. The first thing he did was went and he surveyed the situation. He said, what do we need to do to rebuild this wall? What kind of shape is it in? And he went out, he snuck out at night and he did it. And in chapter 2, he identifies the goal. He said, we got to build that wall first. Yeah. We want to get the people out of exile, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, but the first thing's build the wall. Lane, have you got a picture of that wall? I think that's the last picture I sent you. God bless Lane. I send him pictures the last second, and somehow or the other, he makes it happen. That got mind reader. Okay. So this is the wall at that time that went around Jerusalem. And, and I got to thinking, well, why didn't they build it nice and square and all that kind of stuff? I, this is why I think. There were, they didn't have bulldozers back then. They didn't have major excavators. So they had terrain to work with, right? Rivers, valleys, all those kind of things. They were real smart about how they did it too, JL. They, 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 they knew how to put this thing together. And so that's how it worked out that they would build it like that. So when I begin to talk about the different sections of wall, you'll be able to think about that right there. Let's go all the way down to chapter 2, verse 17 and begin there. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. Lord God, let this be us. Now, I'm not just telling you a story. Say, Alan, don't tell me a story. Make it about me. I'm in the story. What's my part, Alan? Do you want to have a part right here? God's got a part for you in Jesus' name. Got to grab a hold of this right now. I've been beginning to wrestle with this thing, okay? I begin to wrestle with this thing. Uh, I've been praying about this message for probably two months, Pam, because it was like this. I'm, I'm like, or maybe three months or four months. I've been thinking about this. this is what I've been thinking about. This is right from my heart right now. I've been thinking about, Lord, why can't we build this thing? Why isn't it taken off? Why aren't there thousands of people helping other people and loving people and everything else like this? And God began to speak to me, just directly to me. He said, Alan, it's a lot of blood on the ground. I said, Lord, how can I war and build at the same time? He began to show me David. David, a man of war. David wasn't allowed to build the temple, was it? Because there was so much blood. There's going to be the devil's blood around here. That's whose blood there is. But you know, once you, when you start to get involved in people's lives and you don't just play church, you become the church and you do what you need to do to get out there and you take chances on people that may or may not be ready for those chances. And I made some mistakes in that area, by the way. In Jesus' name, forgive me. There's blood around, isn't there? But there's also victory. It's like the lancing, the cutting open so the infection can come out, Tyler. And as it's coming out, it's bleeding everywhere. The blood of Jesus is covering all of it. So we're going to talk about how to war and how to build at the same time in Jesus' name. And God's going to show me how to do better at it too. But we got to do this thing together because this is what Jesus did. This is what 
Paul did. It's what David did as well. But I believe there's a building coming after it too in Jesus' name. Chapter 2, verse 17. Then I said to them, so this is Jeremiah, this is Nehemiah talking. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in here in Jerusalem? It lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and will no longer be a disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand that my God was upon me and what the king had said to me. I'm reading out of the uh, NIV today. This is the Bible that Daryl Gant, my friend, brought me right before I went to prison. This, this is the Bible that God used to open up my spirit to be able to hear him in Jesus' name. And uh, I read from the Amplified most of the time, but today I just wanted to read out of the NIV and read it, wanted to use this Bible. Thank you, Daryl. Verse 18, I also told them about the gracious, somebody say gracious, gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start building. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat, somebody say Sanballat, Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and they ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants and we'll start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or any historic right. So we have the classic confrontations between the Arabs and the Jews right here with Sanballat beginning to mock Nehemiah. What if Nehemiah went home right then? See, we just assume that all of these things that, 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 that happened in the Bible uh, were, were just like uh, ordained or something like that, which they were. But see, a man named Nehemiah had to decide to stick to the task right there. And if we start to understand that, then all of a sudden we're living from Nehemiah's faith to our faith. We're going back to work Monday. We're going home to love on our wives and our kiddos today. And, and we, we're going home to love on each other. But we're doing it with the faith of Nehemiah. Because believe me, there are many sand ballots in your life. There's sand ballots on the Fox News every day. There's sand ballots on the, on the internet every day. Are you listening to them? Are you giving them power? Do you just make you want to quit? The whole design of the Antichrist spirit in this time and forevermore and before, by the way, is to destroy the church. And guess what? You're the church. To destroy the temple. The same way these people were trying to destroy the temple and kill the work of Almighty God, so the devil is after us today. In exactly the same way, the question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it when Sanballat rises up in your own house? Are you going to quiver and shake and make an excuse or think of something in the flesh? I can understand how you can do that. I can understand that. There's no doubt Nehemiah had a real physical fear that came over him. You know, a lot of the problems that people are having right now, when they're trying to breathe, when they get this thing, they're trying to breathe. They know they can breathe, but when they get anxious, their breath begins to fail, fail in the anxiety of those moments. Lord God, right now in Jesus' name, I pray against all the anxiety from the devil right now, all the fear and all the security in all the hospitals. I give you great glory, Lord God, for all the nurses and the doctors and the staff and the love that's going out, the ministers. I can't tell you how many nurses I've cried with in this season, in Jesus' name. And Lord God, we ask you for that resurrection power over every one of them right now. To your glory, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for it, in Jesus' name. Verse chapter three. Okay, now, they said they're fixing to start building. Sand ballot was in their ear. It's like a drum roll right here, Billy. Let's see what happened. Elishabib, the, thank you, Sharon. Elishabib, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work. How about that? The priest went to work. The very first thing out of the deal was the preachers actually did something. How about that? I've been in conversation with preachers during this, this pandemic thing, and they've said things like this. Well, I kind of like it. We don't have to meet as much. I, I, I started me a garden over here. I got me a garden. You should see my tomatoes. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Boy, it's just as easy. Yeah, money's coming in. Yeah, they're sending their tithes. It's a lot easier. 
Don't have to deal with the people very much. You ain't seen that around here, have you? You ain't seen that around here. Because this team right here is rushing into the battle in Jesus' name. I'm so proud of them. Proud of Jesus Burger. Proud of every one of y'all guys in Jesus' name. And guess what? It ain't just a priest. It's every one of us in Jesus' name. You see, we're all priests and we're all royalty and we're all doing this thing together in Jesus' name. These fellow priests went to work and they rebuilt the sheep gate. I love that, man, because the first thing that they rebuilt, sheep gate's up at the top. The sheep gate is right by the fish gate, right by the way, okay? Well, think about that. The she, this, is, this is a little bit of a, the, this, these were real sheep, you know, I keep making sheep noise. That's kind of a goat, forgive me. Okay, okay. These were real sheep, but, but when we start thinking about the sheep, what, what are we? We're sheep, right? All we like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone to his own way, but God laid on Jesus all of our iniquity, took him away. So right at the sheep gate, that's the first thing that the priest started to rebuild. Think about that right now. See, if the sheep get out, there ain't no sense in having a dead gum gate. There ain't no sense in having anything, right? Don't need a pen. You got no sheep. So we're going to work on the sheep first. You know, when this thing started and all this rebellion started, I began to see it in the spirit where it was the Antichrist spirit. I began to see it and I preached real strong and real hard. And not some of the sheep might have got scared, but I thank you guys for sticking with me in Jesus' name. I thank you for staying the course. And I see many more sheep coming back and coming back and coming back in Jesus' name, okay? But the priest began to work on the sheep gate. They dedicated it. They set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of 100, which they dedicated as far as the Tower of Hanai. The men of Jericho, somebody say Jericho, yeah. built the adjoining section. And Zakur, the son of Emmer, built next to him. The fish gate, somebody say fish gate, fish gate. was rebuilt by the sons of Hanessa. So this is a, uh, you know, they, they eat a lot of fish there. They, the Sea of Galilee wasn't too far away. And so they got to get the fish in and out of the city, right? And so that's the, where, where it was right there. And so it's coming, coming right there. Well, you know what? We got some things to eat too, don't we? What did Jesus feed those guys whenever he came back from being on the cross and he was on that, he was on that beach? And Peter and John jumped out of that boat and began to run to him. What did he feed them? He fed them the fish right there, didn't he? The fish is for us. The bread is for us. The 20 years between 9-11 and now, that time is gone. But the next 20 years, what are we going to do? Because this is another chance for us to rebuild the wall of the American church right now in Jesus' name. It's another opportunity for us to do it. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hanassah. They laid the beams. They put the doors and bolts in place. They put the bars in place. Maranoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hezok, repaired the next section. Next to him, Mislam, the son of Barak, the son of Mashabella, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, the son, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tokyo. But, somebody say but. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to work under their supervisors. Okay. Got some guys that were a little too cool to, to, to join the team. So each one of these sections, as they build it around, they're built by men of different and women and daughters. So later on, it talks about daughters of different towns. So there was a town of this region, you build this 100 foot. There's a town of this region, you come build this 200 foot. So this is how it is in our churches right now, okay? Not one church can minister to everyone, right? So church by church, this wall can be rebuilt in Jesus' name. The Christian wall can be rebuilt in this time. Now, these guys did not tell each other how to do it. The priest did not go over to the other guys and say, okay, you guys from Zokiah, here's how I want you to do it, okay? No, they said, this section is yours. It's your responsibility. These are your sheep. How are you going to rebuild it? Every one of us is thinking about our family right now in Jesus' name, okay? How is your, how's God going to rebuild your family? How's he going to bring your family back together right now? Well, God has given you that responsibility for rebuilding that section of the wall in your life, in your time right now. It will not happen by accident. How do we rebuild those sections? We talk about the truth, Rudy. We say, you know what? These were things in our life that we let in our life that were unholy in our life. 
We can't have this in our life. We want to rebuild right now in these moments and rebuild on a firm foundation and start this thing back over. God wants us to be those priests and be those builders together in Jesus' name. And I believe that you are. I know that you are. All across America, from the East Coast and the West Coast, from the North and the South. Let's pray for all these churches to come together right now. Daryl, would you pop up right there and say a prayer that all the church will just come together, wherever we are. Yes. You're not a God that wants this for your people, that wants for this beggar, this hostility. That's right. This, this dissension. You want a people that are united, united under the banner of the cross of Jesus. And God, give us a vision. Put our hand. That's right. Yes. 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 In our own families, in our own, in our own communities, on the social media, where God knows I have faith, and it it tells us. Thank you, Lord. Hold up one another. Yes. Yes. Because it's what you called us to Yes. 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 Do you agree with what Daryl just prayed, church? Hallelujah. I agree with that 100%. You see, here's what the problem is. The problem is each church has their own agenda instead of having kingdom purpose. Are you ready to drop all the purposes that are not all about Jesus right now? Let's just see them clatter and fall by the wayside right now in Jesus' name. Let's just hear them just clink down like a a bunch of cowboys dropping their guns in the saloon right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So we just stand there naked before you, Lord God ready for our task. And our task is done in our heart, y'all. It's done in our spirit in Jesus' name. This is how I fight my battles. But we've been fighting our battles the wrong way. Chapter four, verse one. When Sanballat, you think that guy's gonna go away? That guy ain't going away. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. He was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in the presence of the associates of the army of Samaria. And he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? People have been picking on the Jews forever. Do you understand that? Out of jealousy, out of a thousand things, mostly because the devil hates God's people. That's the root of the whole thing. Happened in the Garden of Eden. What are those feeble Jews doing? What are those feeble guys over at Treasure doing? What are those feeble guys up underneath that tree feeding people every, every Saturday? What do they think they're doing? You think they're making a difference over there? What are those feeble guys doing over there? Will they restore their wall? Ha, ha, ha. Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even if a fox climbed up on that wall, it would break down the stones. Nehemiah begins to pray. Would you begin to pray with me, treasure? Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder and the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they've thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall. So we rebuilt the wall. So we rebuilt the wall. I can't hear you. So we rebuilt the wall. So I rebuilt the wall. So we rebuilt the wall. So we rebuilt the wall. And it reached its height for the people worked with all their heart. 
So we rebuilt the wall. Lord God, rebuild the walls in America. Rebuild the walls here at Treasure, at Shade Tree, all over East Texas in Jesus' name. Let us do our part to encourage people and not be in a big tug of war with people. Nehemiah chapter four, verse seven. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites and the men from Ashad heard that the repairs of Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, uh uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> they got a little angry. <laughs> and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. I asked dad a few things as his ability to communicate, Vincent, was diminishing. And I said I was really in a tough place and felt like everything was coming against us. And I said, dad, what do you, what do, you do when you just ain't working and so many things are going wrong and people aren't coming together. What do you do? And he said, now, circle the wagons. And I begin to implore one more time, Randy, one more time, Kim, but dad, I already circled the wagons. Already circled the wagons. He said, circle the wagons again, son, and press in. Circle the wagons and press in. See, if anybody knew how not to quit, it was my daddy. If anybody knows how not to quit, it's Dale Perkins right now, laying in that hospital right now in Jesus' name. Those guys have taught me how not to quit. If anybody knows how not to quit, it's Fred Curtis sitting right there in that spot. If anybody knows how not to quit, it's my daddy still waiting over there in Buckner. Forgot to call him home, but in the meantime, he's warring with us in the spirit right now in Jesus' name. And if there was anybody that didn't quit, it's Nehemiah right here. Now, how about you? I'm looking you in the eye. Are you ready to go? Are you, is it your time? Are you ready to rush into this battle? Are you ready to build this wall in Jesus' name? Even when they're laughing at you, they were all very angry. You see, you see, they, the, 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 the devil will go get his friends. Wasn't just Sandballot. Now it's all these guys coming and dogpiling you. Okay? Expect it. Okay? Expect it. When you start really doing something for the kingdom of God, expect this to happen. We see it over and over again. We see it in all of these warriors. We see the blood right here at Treasure in Jesus' name. To his glory because we see the resurrection. You see, if there would not have been any blood, there would not be a resurrection. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up the trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and we posted a guard night and day to meet the threat. So they did two things here. They prayed to the Lord, but then they did something about it too. They prayed and they posted a guard. They saw, okay, these guys are coming. We're not going to be Pollyanny about this and per- have rose-colored glasses and pretend like everything's just going to go away. No, we're going to be men of prayer and men and women of action in Jesus' name. And so they begin to post a guard and they begin to have watchmen. I know that there's watchmen over your household, isn't it? There are watchmen over your household right now. Father God, I pray for the watchmen over the households of my brothers and sisters right now in Jesus' name, wherever they're living, over their families. I thank you, Lord God, that the men and the women that are prophetic in this house, which is all of us, because we're all hearing from you right now this morning in Jesus' name. And we're hearing that we just can't pray. We must go into action as well in Jesus' name. So we post the guard and we pray over our household. And Father, many sand ballots are in our families. I see that discouraging, laughing at mom, laughing at dad, laughing at grandma, because we believe in Jesus and they believe in the world and they believe in the devil and they just don't think it's real at all. And the, 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 the mocking is coming, but you're not going to hear it in Jesus name because you posted a guard, posted a guard over your own heart that it can't get into your heart and you're not going to receive that in Jesus name. So they posted a guard and they went to pray in verse 10. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There's so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. And our enemies, before they know it, they'll see us. And they'll be right here among us. If I had to put one word on that, what would it be? It would be fear, wouldn't it? There will be people on the team that start to fear. There will be people naturally in our family that are not, have quite as much faith as you got. And we're not going to chunk a rock at them either. 
we're going to go hold them. We're going to walk with them in Jesus' name. That's how we do it. And I didn't do that so great when we very first started this pandemic, by the way. I was, I was, I, I should have worked with the people that were living in that fear place more than I did. And I want to work with this right now in Jesus' name to say God has told us over and over that we can trust him and that we're not to fear no matter what happens. The things we see in this world are temporary anyway, aren't they? The things we don't see are eternal in Jesus' name. So what do we have to fear, Billy? Okay, now, this is what happened. The people started to fear. Then the Jews who lived near them came and, and told us 10 times over, wherever they turn, they'll attack us. Verse 13, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall. That's the most exposed place. Posting them by families with their swords and their spears. And after I looked, things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and, and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your home. Okay. That's what's got to be the inspiration. I can't just sit here and say, do not fear. I can pray for you not to fear, but see at that point, Austin, we come to that place where it's got to be a rising up inside of us in the spirit, Gisela, that says, I'm going to fight for my daddy. I'm going to fight for him in the spirit. I, I, I'm not going to live in the flesh. I'm going to fight this way. And it's got to be a rising in every one of us that say, I'm going to fight for my brothers and sisters because I care about them. What if they left? What if they ran away? Then there'll be nobody to fight for them. You are the warriors. You're the ones that got the sword. You're the ones that got the power of the spirit and it's time to fight in Jesus' name. If ever there was a time to fight in my lifetime, it's right now. And I praise God that you're doing it and you know how to do it. Fight for your family, my friends. When our enemy heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall to his own work in Jesus' name. They had a choice to make right there. They could have quit, gone home, taken their ball, not have nobody to play ball with. They didn't do it that way. They said, no, we're going back. We temporarily lost our focus. So God is showing us something. Maybe you're at a place, maybe your family or your friends are in a place where you temporarily lost focus. You temporarily heard all of the naysayers and all the painful things in America. And you temporarily got focused on the wrong thing. You got frustrated with the politics of everything. And, and that became your God for a moment. That's okay. But can we do something different today in Jesus' name? I implore you, I ask you, I challenge you to begin to fight for your brothers and sisters. And let's go back to work. Let's go back to work. I'll tell you what happened whenever the thing, that this thing happened and I couldn't quite be with as many people as I wanted to in the first place. And the devil should never have done that because that's when we started writing the journey. The day that happened, the day that that basketball shut down, God spoke to me, sit down son, I'm fixing to give you this right now. And he started writing that thing chapter by chapter by chapter, very intentionally in Jesus name. He's, he's almost finished. It's getting closer and closer in Jesus name. Thousands of people are gonna get changed to the glory of God in Jesus name. It's coming. We ain't quitting. We returning to work, y'all. We returning to work. Don't send me a check. I don't want your check, government. I want to go to work. Y'all can do it, boys. From that day on, half of the men did the work and the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and mirrors. The officers posted themselves behind the people in Judah who were building a wall. Those who carried the materials did their work with one hand and, and, a, and a weapon in the other. Each of the, uh, each of the builders wore his sword at his side at all times, and he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet, he stayed with me all the time. We've always got to be aware. We've always got to have the watchman in place. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive, and it's spread out, and we're widely separated along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there, and God, somebody say God. God, God will fight for us. So we continued the work. Half of the men with spears, the other half with the weapons of work. I want to talk to you one, but one more thing. I want to talk to you about offense and defense. Okay, so all right, I'm gonna walk around a little bit because I see some of y'all getting sleepy. I'll get a water gun next week. Okay, that's me, my weapon. I get you. I'll go like a gangster too, sideways. I want to talk to you. You don't think I can do an ant? 
Gotcha. How can we play offense and defense at the same time? How can we have the sword and be, be working at the same time? We can do it, okay? God showed us in the disciples' prayer when he began to say this, our Father who art in heaven, he showed us in this prayer how to play offense and defense at the same time. No, I just got to be worried all the time and scared all the time and playing defense. No, every day we're going to take ground for the kingdom. Every day we're going to put another rock in place. Anybody on my team that's been meeting with me regularly or at any time, I always tell them, we're going to take some ground today. We're going to take some ground today. Yeah, we got to protect the sheep. We got to make sure that that's in place. We got to do some maintenance. But we're going to be taking ground at the same time in Jesus' name. We're not stopping. Offense is kingdom building, evangelism, making disciples, seeing healing, seeing freedom, deliverance, helping the hurting people. That's all taking ground. Here's the defense, kingdom maintenance, training people as sons and daughters in their identity so that they're going to be healthy, defending the faith with the word of God. Comforting the hurting, watering Gilbert, watering the seeds that are already in the ground, having the prophetic vision of the watchman to see the danger coming, defeating fear, crucifying our flesh, living in God's rest, receiving healing, operating as healthy sons and daughters. All of those things are defense. Here's the offense again, in case you forget. Making disciples, evangelism, healing, taking new ground, freedom, deliverance, helping people, helping the hurting people, reaching out, benevolence, all of that is offense. But here's, the, here's, the, here's our Father's prayer. Here's how it says it. So I'm telling you this because our prayer life can change right here. That's really what I want to get at. I believe our prayer life needs, a lot of our prayer lives need to change right now. A lot of our prayer life that says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, absolutely, yes. The, 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 the model prayer talks about that. Our Father who art in heaven. See, that very first line identifies us as what? His children. His children. It's an identity thing. Yes, he's our Father and we're his children. So that's our position. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yes. It's a powerful and beautiful thing. I, Daddy, I need you so much. I, Abba, I need you so much. I give you glory for all the hope that we have in our life. I thank you for all of these things that you've done for me. But mostly, I thank you for Jesus that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now we've cemented our position as we go into this power, at the powering prayer in Jesus' name. Now if we pray from a fear position, we say, oh, please don't let me get sick. Thank you for not letting me get sick. Uh, uh, I'm not sick. Please heal them and heal them. You know, but how about, how about God? I am your son. I believe in you and I trust you. I fear nothing because you told me to fear nothing. I receive no cry from Sanballat today in Jesus' name. You told me to heal the sick. I'm going to do it. Where's somebody I can lay hands on them in Jesus' name? We begin to play, begin to become offensive and at the same time operating in security. Let's look at, the, let's look at this prayer. So the first line is, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, most honored be your name. Never start a prayer, never talk to the Lord God, never have anything in your heart except for that right there. His condition as king and our condition as sons and daughters is the perfect place and the only place to begin in Jesus' name. But isn't that so humbling to know of his love that he's captured us in his loving arms and that we can trust him in Jesus' name. Your kingdom come. Now this is offense. Your kingdom come. Maranatha, baby, is happening in Jesus' name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that is power. If God's saying that I can pray the power of heaven into my circumstance of life right now, that is power. That's awesome. That's when we change our eyes. Remember when I, I gave you them glasses that one time? I said, give me them glasses. Give me them eyeballs, Steve. I'm going to give you some new eyeballs. I'm going to give you these spirit eyes so you can be able to see from eternity in Jesus' name. When we begin to pray from heaven to earth, God changes you. That's offense right there. If your prayers are like that, God, I know in heaven it's perfect. Right now, we're praying that it's perfect right here in Jesus' name. We're praying for perfection in my family right now to your glory. We start to see it manifested too. Third line, give us this day our daily bread. Now that's a defense. We got to have some bread. Where's the bread? Bread's right here. 
Jesus is the bread. Give me my daily bread. Okay, empower me, fill me with your bread, take care of me in the physical, take care of me in the spiritual. Next line, forgive us our debts. This is defensive too. We wanna put ourselves, Lindsay, in a position where we are, uh, have clean hands and a pure heart coming before God, right? We don't wanna come before him all sinning and, sinning and bloody. We come before him like that. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, that can just be a prayer or it can say, God, there's somebody I didn't forgive, Joseph. I'm gonna forgive that guy today. That guy hurt my feelings. This is a prayer where we have got to get our life straight right here. This is a prayer of repentance. Forgive me, God, I have sinned. I see my sin, oh Lord. I have to forgive some other people right now who've spoken ill of me and been sand ballots in my life. I forgive you, sand ballot. You're just a lost person, it's okay. Give me a chance to lead you to Jesus someday. How about that? Next line is this, lead us not into temptation. That's defense also. Okay, I got the watchman posted. Lead me not into defense. But deliver me, back to the offense. Deliver me from the evil one. Bam! You can't hold me, man. I'm gonna catch you with a short right cross. Bam! And the jumpers. Last line, offense. Thy is the power and the, king, the kingdom and the power and the glory. Back to offense. Do you understand what your prayer should look like now? In Jesus' name. This is how Nehemiah was doing it. They were building with offense and defense. If, if you're dead, you can't be much offense, can you? So we got to protect the house first and then move on from there. But you know what? If the opposition never scores, guess what? We win, right? I told you this the other day. You ever play checkers with a guy that will never move his back row? That dude just won, right? We've got to be so planted and so secure in the Holy Ghost that that's how it is. Joe, would you guys come? We got to protect the temple first. We got to build that wall to protect the temple. We started looking at the, at the, at the armor of God. Only one of those weapons were offensive. We're going to look at this last scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 5. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Some of us have been just like these enemies of God, we have allowed our emotions to make us angry. And then we have fought from a place of anger. And we, we, may, we may say it's righteous indignation, but mostly it's just anger. I mean, let's get real. So we gotta release that. We gotta release people to be able to fight with the weapons God wants us to. So if we come into this last scripture, I'm gonna pray this, and I pray that we just come in agreement here. We have a power, uh, the power of, of, of our purpose to live, building God's kingdom, and the power of our partnership together. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they are divine in power. They're from heaven, and they demolish strongholds. We demolish our arguments and every pretense that sets itself self up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive and we make it subject to Christ. You see, we must engage the power of the presence of our Father in heaven to defeat the enemy and defeat his agenda and take away all of his power all of his lies and his oppression and his fear. Let me say this again. This is our prayer in action. We must engage the power and the presence of our Father in heaven to defeat the enemy. I wanna to submit to you guys that you can engage the power of the presence of God 24-7, 365. There is no need for us ever to move out of the power and out of the presence of God to let any sin ballots into our life. So in Jesus' name, I pray, Father God, that anything that we're battling against right now, that we engage your power and your presence and that we win this victory in Jesus' name. We engage the power and presence of God to build his kingdom in us first and in the world. We can't build God's kingdom if it's not in us first. So that's our purpose. Some of us, I believe God has changed your agenda in this house this morning. 
I believe God has changed your agenda to, you know what? I'm going to be like Nehemiah. I'm going to lead my people. I'm going to lead my family. I'm going to rebuild my section of the wall. I'm going to be a good defender of the house, and I'm going to be taking ground every day in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together.